strength and physique athletes have been advocating for training with a high intensity for a long time. Whether we look to the Bulgarian era of weightlifting, where lifters were often maxing out, sometimes even multiple times per day, in the snatch, clean and jerk, and squat, or we look to esteemed bodybuilders like Dorian Gates or Mike Menser, who often advocated for taking most of your working sets, if not all of them, to or even past the point of failure. As you can see, proponents of high intensity training have been around for decades. However, the issue in most of these contexts is that intensity is usually poorly defined. What can happen is we end up diluting our attention away from the training variables that are actually responsible for progressing strength or muscle growth respectively. In today's video, we're gonna better define intensity and make sure none of the time in the gym is wasted. Questioning the ambiguity of the term intensity isn't a new concept. In 2012, Dr. James Steele wrote a paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine making the case that the term intensity shouldn't be used without further clarification with the training variables being referred to. In resistance training, Dr. Steele separates intensity into the intensity of load and the intensity of effort. Ultimately, I like to use slightly different terminology, but the concept of separating intensity into different domains is really useful to think about the implications on training adaptations. Specifically, I like to separate intensity into four different domains, load, proximity to failure, intended velocity, and a concept I like to call psychological acuity. Let's go through each of these four domains, their relevance to training for strength and muscle growth, starting with load. We can define load as the external resistance relative to an individual's maximum capacity. In practice, this is probably best proxied by the percentage of one arm on the bar. As Josh said in our last video, a recent preprint meta-analysis by Swinton and colleagues demonstrates a strong relationship between the percentage of one arm utilized and the strength gains observed, such that heavier loads tend to increase strength more than lighter loads. These results tend to line up nicely with the principle of specificity. If you consider that a one RM is essentially an assessment of maximum force production, and that peak forces rise linearly alongside increases in load. You can see that training with heavier loads is more specific to 1RM, which may help to explain the findings of this meta-analysis. On the other hand, so long as sets are terminated pretty close to failure, and more on this in a bit, load really doesn't seem to have an influence on muscle growth at all. If we revisit a meta-analysis by Ruffalo and colleagues, we can see that there really is no difference in outcomes between conditions that train with less than 60% of 1RM and those that train with loads heavier than 60% of 1RM. Now, to tie this together mechanistically, we need to introduce another domain of intensity, proximity to failure. To keep it simple, proximity to failure can be defined as the number of repetitions in reserve, or RAR, upon terminating a set. Now we could spend a lot of time on this definition, so if you'd like to see a video on the nuances on the definition of failure, leave a comment below. The RER in which a set is terminated doesn't seem to have an independent influence on strength gains. In other words, once the load is determined, let's say 75% of 1RM, the RER in which that set is terminated doesn't seem to alter strength gains a whole lot. This can be visualized by our recent preprint meta-analysis that examined the dose-response relationship between RER and strength gains at a given load. And as you can see, the curve is essentially flat, meaning there doesn't really seem to be a meaningful relationship between RER and strength gains once load has been taken out of the equation. Once again, the principle of specificity with regards to force production could help to explain the observed relationship here. If you consider an example where you have 75% of your 1RM loaded on the bar for a set of squats to failure, you'll know that as you fatigue, the bar speed is going to decay throughout the set. In reality, this is signifying a decrease in force per repetition as you fatigue. Thus, you can see that the reps early in the set are actually the ones that are the most specific to a 1RM with regards to force production. Thinking this way may help to explain the observed relationship in our preprint meta-analysis where training closer to failure doesn't seem to augment strength gains. In fact, a recent meta-analysis by Zhang and colleagues actually shows that the repetitions early in a set lead to the greatest relative strength gain. Now, the studies included in this analysis are actually confounded by additional components of training volume, but due to the low overall set volumes used in these studies, I have a hard time believing and that completely explains the observed relationship. Looking at the similar dose response curve for hypertrophy, you can see as sets are terminated closer to failure, changes in muscle size tend to improve. However, when we're using heavy loads, somewhere greater than 80% of 1RM or so, the curve tends to flatten out, suggesting that when we're training with heavy loads, we may not need to train as close to failure to optimize outcomes. Now, to cautiously explain this with some mechanistic rationale, a recent paper by Murphy and colleagues could be of some utility. In this study, the authors examined motor unit behavior in response to isometric contractions held until the point of momentary failure with either a high or low percentage of the individual's maximal isometric strength. Now, while there are some limitations with this study, the author observed that the high load condition resulted in greater muscle excitation initially, but as the conditions grew closer to momentary failure, the two conditions converged. 
If we accept the premise that high levels of methyl excitation are permissive to delivering mechanical tension, which is thought to be the primary mechanism of muscle growth to the most muscle fibers, it can help to explain the idea that as long as sets are taken to failure, load really doesn't seem to influence hypertrophy, and when using heavy loads, sets don't need to be terminated as close to failure to optimize outcomes. At a given load in RER, the repetitions throughout a set can be performed in a variety of ways. Think of one lifter performing every rep as explosively as possible, while another deliberately slows them. This concept illustrates the next domain of intensity, intended velocity. For strength, we have a decent amount of evidence to inform the best intended velocity. For the concentric portion of a repetition, a recent meta-analysis by Hermes and colleagues demonstrates that conditions using a fast concentric tempo versus those that deliberately slow the concentric portion of a repetition see superior strength gains. Once again, the principle of specificity with regards to force production can help us out here. If you're aiming to move a fixed mass as fast as possible, or you're going to accelerate it faster, that ultimately is going to lead to greater force production. Once again, making those repetitions more specific to a 1RM, which can help to explain greater strength gains with conditions trying to move the bar as fast as possible. Alternatively, we have considerably less data on the best intended velocity for the eccentric portion of a repetition. On one hand, some data shows that performing faster eccentrics allow for greater performance on the concentric portion of a repetition, which is ultimately what we care about for a 1RM. On the other hand, performing the eccentric too quickly probably can lead to a loss of control, which can make all the difference on a max attempt. Thus, tentatively, performing the eccentric as fast as possible while still remaining control for the concentric portion of the lift is probably the best way to go for strength gains. For muscle growth, the evidence is much less clear. A recent review paper by Wilkin colleagues suggests that while repetition tempo is minimally influential for muscle growth, particularly when sets are taken close to failure, performing the concentric portion as explosively as possible with a controlled eccentric portion seems to have the most support. This seems to fit nicely with the mechanistic rationale from the data from Murphy and colleagues that we previously discussed. As more force is produced during a repetition performed with an explosive concentric and a controlled eccentric, one could reasonably assume greater levels of muscle excitation to follow. In theory, this may allow greater level of mechanical tension to be delivered to more muscle fibers early in a set. However, if the set is taken all the way to failure, things may wash out. Very similar to the data by Murphy and colleagues between high and low loads, when sets are taken all the way to failure, the differential patterns between repetition tempo ultimately may not matter. The final domain of intensity is probably best introduced with an example. In both of these sets, the lifter is using the same load, RAR, and intended velocity, yet one of the two conditions seemed to be a higher intensity. In the first example, the lifter is focused, lifting the preferred music, and has a high degree of psychological arousal entering the set. In the second example, the lifter is distracted with emails, talking with friends right up until the point they begin their set, and comes in with very minimal arousal. Now, despite all the aforementioned training variables being equated, one lifter is clearly training with a higher intensity on that set. This illustrates the final domain well, psychological acuity. I like to define this concept as our ability to reach maximal performance for a given set of task demands. Now in the research, there are multiple examples where psychological acuity seems to be impacted. The first example is mental fatigue, where there's a decrease in repetition performance following a cognitively demanding task, despite maximal force capacity seemingly being unaffected. Another example is where a lifter exhibits pacing strategies ultimately limiting their performance throughout a set, despite being told to train with maximal effort the entire time. The point here is that training with greater psychological acuity is probably going to improve our performance in the short term. And while it's a little bit of a logical leap, I think one can reasonably assume that that's probably going to maximize our gains in strength and size respectively. As you can see, the aspects of intensity that are the most important is ultimately dependent on your training goal. For strength, using your recovery resources on training with heavy loads and the appropriate intended velocities is going to be your best bet. For hypertrophy, proximity to failure is probably much more important and gives you access to a range of intended velocities that are acceptable. For both goals, training with a high degree of psychological acuity is probably going to maximize progress over time is an important aspect of intensity that shouldn't be overlooked. Hopefully this video helped to break down intensity and discuss which of the domains is most pertinent to your training goals. Understanding these concepts can make sure that your time in the gym is most effective and efficient. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe, like the video, leave a comment on what you'd like to see us do next, and if you'd like this information delivered directly to your inbox, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter link below.